The White Witch Podcast with me, Carly. On today's episode, we are talking all about bewitching poisonous plants. But our book review for today is Entering Hecate's Garden, The Magic, Medicine and Mystery of Plant Spirit Witchcraft, written by Cindy Branham. This is an amazing witchy book. I would say this is now my ultimate go-to in regards to plants and how to use them within my practice. This couldn't be any more witchy if it tried. There's so much lore woven through the information in relation to Hecate, Persephone, Circe, Medea, and many of the Greek deities. There are elaborate spells and rituals, but also simple spells and rituals that you can carry out. Such a wealth of information in here. She outlines 39 plants ranging from the esoteric to the very accessible. Each one listed has an outline of their Latin name, spiritual properties, which parts of the body they support, magical properties, which parts you should use and what for planetary correspondences, elemental correspondences, their archetypes, zodiac sign, and which animal, crystal, and color that they are linked to. It gives insight into how much to use and how to do it safely, and it does also go into poisonous plants and how not to use them. It has smatterings of poetry that run throughout the book about the deities that I loved that added to the book's charm, Overall, it's an incredibly mystical read. It really does feel like you're reading an ancient Hedgewitch's botanical guide. It's a full-on read, so you do really need to focus when reading it, akin to Psychic Witch by Matt Orin and Cindy Brannan's other book, Keeping Her Keys. More the sort of book you could really study within your book of shadows. There's such a wealth of information in relation to plant spirits, the anatomy of a spell, Great sections on making puppets for all manner of needs, both positive and negative, and exactly how to work with them. She doesn't shy away from using like hair, blood, or bones within this book. This is one of those books I probably need to read two or three times. First time rounds, I picked up so much knowledge. I wish I'd made more notes, but it's perfect to reference each time you come across a plant that you might wish to work with. Most of the time for this sort of information, I would find myself trawling the internet or Pinterest tirelessly. Alongside the plant information, the chapters of the books that I, the book that I loved are called The Spell, The Prophecy, The Sacred, the wisdom and the mystery. So those chapters delve into so much in relation to spell work and the craft. This is like a whole terms course in botanicals, if you ask me. And reading this feels like you are reading an old mystical forbidden witchcraft book that is like kept in the British Library or at Oxford University. And you have to put those little gloves on to read it and like have someone watching over you as you do. Like think of the scene at the beginning of the book and TV show, Discovery of Witches that actually has to be like one of my actual dreams come to think of it. But yes, that's the feels that I got with this book. Cindy Brannan, the author, has a magnificent podcast already called Keeping Her Keys. That is really worth a listen. I really love her work. She has some of the best information I've seen out there if you work with Hecate. And also go onto her website, www.keepingherkeys.com. Join me after the break when we talk all about the witch's garden and bewitching poisonous plants. Welcome back. So let's talk all about bewitching poisonous plants. 
I thought I would talk you through four of the most poisonous plants found in witchcraft and what they were used for. There are, of course, others, but these were the ones that were of most interest to me. So we have hemlock, yew, wolfsbane and deadly nightshade, all of which go by different names, which we will come to shortly. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, a witch's brew is concocted by three witches within a dark cave under a thunderstorm to conjure up the souls of the dead. Into the cauldron, they threw magical animal parts and cursed objects along with plant ingredients, poison hemlock and yew. And of course, once all the ingredients were in the cauldron, they chanted, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. We, of course, cannot guarantee this concoction would have brought back the souls of Scottish kings, but we do know that Hemlock and you both have the right kind of qualities to wind up in deathly witches brews. Poison Hemlock has the Latin name Conium Maculatum. Other names it goes by are Beaver Poison, Herb Bennet, Musquash Root, Spotted Corabane, Spotted Hemlock, Canada Pitch Tree, Weeping Hemlock and Poison Parsley. It is a highly poisonous plant. It comes from the Apiacai family. Terrible pronunciations, plenty to come on today's episode. It has tall stems with a purple streak on the lower half, which gives it the Latin name maculatum, which means with spots. It has clusters of small white flowers And when it's crushed, the leaves emit a foul smell. It's highly invasive if planted and nearly impossible to control. So the poison within poison hemlock comes from the chemical compounds found within it called conine. This inhibits the central nervous system if ingested and paralyzes the central nervous system to the point of respiratory collapse. It takes around six to eight poison hemlock leaves to kill an adult, but the roots and the seeds are even more powerful. And the witches knew this as their recipe called for the plant's roots specifically. Queens, like Queen Anne's lace and poison hemlock are said to look very similar. So be careful to look closely enough. It's also similar to caraway, wild carrot and valerium. So hemlock is a narcotic, a sedative, an analgesic, a spasmolytic, an anti-aphrodisiac. It should not be ingested under any circumstances and any recipes for medicines that refer to hemlock are said to be for hemlock spruce, which is a completely different species of plant. So its magical uses are for astral projection, purification, consecration, immortality, grounding, and historically it was used in spells for destroying sexual drives. The juice of hemlock was also rubbed onto magical knives and swords to empower them before they were used. Its powers in relation to spell work linked to fertility, protection, psychic protection, renewal and strength. Its gender is feminine, its element is water, its planet is Saturn, and it's linked to the deities Hecate, Cronus and Saturn. So let's talk all about the you. The second plant mentioned in the witch's brew in Shakespeare's Macbeth was the you, which is also known in Latin as Taxus Baccata. So this is a coniferous tree and all parts of the yew tree are poisonous except for the fleshy fruit of the aril, which is the berries. These should still not be consumed though as the seeds inside them are highly toxic. Taxine is a compound within the yew that makes it so poisonous and taxine affects the cardiovascular system. So once ingested, the taxine can cause increased heart rate, convulsion, respiratory distress, and even heart failure. Even after a yew tree dies, the poison will still remain. 
And the yew tree is said to stand for death, rebirth, resurrection, immortality, protection, longevity, change, divinity, strength and eternity. So the yew is said to never die as a new tree can spring forth from its center as the older tree passes away. And the yew is said to be the only living thing or like creature biologically capable of living indefinitely. It's a British medium sized evergreen with a lifespan that can run up to at least 2000 years. Most churchyards contain ancient yew trees and it's believed that some of the circle arrangements of planting that were made were planted as such to protect power spots within a community. There is a documented case at St Mary's Churchyard in Selborne in January 1990 where a yew tree fell in a storm. When they lifted out the tree's root ball, the bones of around 30 of the graveyard's residents came up with it too and the roots and the bones they just all intertwined so the yew is an ancient evergreen from the depths of the primeval forests that reigned across the globe before the arrival of broad-leaved trees so yews have the ability to root their branches and that makes them virtually deathless One Scottish yew tree in Perthshire named the Fortinal yew is said to be 9,000 years old. Perthshire, Perthshire. The yew is the grandparent of the Celtic woodland, the longest living of all the British trees. It understands the cycles of energy that unfold within mankind as it like witnesses the wheel turn many times It begins its own cycle over again when it dies and the new yew tree springs from within to continue the cycle of life turning. So this is where it gets its reputation as the tree of rebirth, death and transformation. Some of the most sacred sites discovered were found within groves of yews and many of the church grounds that yew trees are within, like the yew trees will often predate the church and Christianity itself, so indicate that an ancient sacred site was already present long before the church was ever built there. The yew tree is said to be linked to the Saturn, like the planet Saturn and Pluto, and its element is earth and water. It's linked to the metal lead, It is said that a fence post made of yew will easily outlast one made of iron. It's linked to the crystal olivine and the animals eagle and hummingbird. Its colours are dark green and black and it's linked to the deities Dion, Artemis, Persephone, Hecate, Astarte and Odin. And you is said to be of feminine gender. It embodies the crone aspect of the triple goddess. And it's also one of the guardians of the underworld that assists in guiding souls from one world to the next. It's obviously heavily associated with the winter solstice. And its magical properties are immortality, regeneration, rebirth, everlasting life, transformation, protection against evil, connecting with the ancestors, linked to shamanism, dreams, heightening psychic abilities and very old magic. So you is also using spells to raise the spirits of the dead and you can burn you to contact spirits of the deceased. You wood is also perfect for making wands. Although all of the tree is poisonous, the fleshy part of the berries was used as a diuretic or a laxative, but only the fleshy part of the berry as the seeds are deadly too. Yew poison was historically used as a cardiac stimulant and the yew tree was also known as the forbidden tree as it was used to stimulate abortion. Its leaves and bark contain small amounts of an anti-cancer agent taxol that inhibits cancer cell growth. So let's talk all about the yew fairy. She is said to be one of the oldest tree spirits and has a depth and power difficult to understand because it's so ancient, because she is so ancient. She carries the breath of the unutterable ancient from cave and grave, shadow forest where the sun cannot penetrate 
The Yu Fairy's wisdom is beyond words, so often comes across as visions instead. And it's said that these visions shouldn't be dissected as our conscious mind is unlikely to have the ability to comprehend this ancient knowledge. The Yu Fairy forms a connection with the eternal, carrying ancestral knowledge alongside opening the doorway for future generations. This fairy can bring you close to your loved ones that have passed on and also provides us with the ability to put things into perspective as many of our worries and concerns are dwarfed by the passage of all the centuries. The yew teaches us through being a tree that can outlive all other trees as well as most of the course of human history. It's symbolic of the sum of all wisdom. It contains all the lessons of the other trees and it's said that we too contain all the experiences, knowledge and understanding of all our ancestors. So let's talk all about deadly nightshade. I feel so gothic and Morticia Adams just uttering its name, aka Atropa belladonna or belladonna. It's a tall branching plant from the Selenakai family that can grow up to five foot in height. It has purple bell-shaped flowers that are tinged with green and it has cherry-sized green berries that ripen to dark purple or black. You also have yellow belladonna, a rare variety of the plant that is strangely pale yellow. Common folk names for the plant are bane wart, black cherry, deadly nightshade, devil's cherries, devil's herbs, devour, Dwayle, which was linked to the Scandinavian word dool, meaning sleep. Clue is in the name. We'll come back to that. Dwayberry, great moral, love apple, naughty man's cherries. Why? Poison black cherry, sorcerer's cherries. There's a theme here, right? And witch's berries. Its common name Belladonna originates from the Italian for beautiful lady and it was named for Atropos, one of the three fates who held the shears that cut the thread of life. So if you didn't know, like me, who the three fates are, these are from the time of the poet Hesiod from 8th century BC. So the fates were personified as three very old women who spin the threads of human destiny. Their names were Clotho, which means spinner, Lachesis, Alotta, which means Alotta, and Astropos, which means inflexible. I don't know. I'm just retelling you the information that I found. But yes, that's the three fates for you. So belladonna is a perennial plant and it's happiest growing within woodlands in shady areas in moist soil. It's native to Europe, North Africa and Western Asia and it blooms midsummer through to early autumn. Its leaves have a sharp bitter odour. The berries are said to smell like ripened tomatoes. The flowers don't really have a scent and the leaves and roots are said to have a bitter taste and the berries are somewhat sweet, but let's not go trying them. As it's one of the most toxic plants and every part of the plant contains tropane alkaloids. The root is the most toxic part and ingesting two berries can kill an adult as can ingesting just one leaf. It's also toxic to animals and can cause them narcosis and paralysis. The plant also contains hyoscyamine and the and atropine or tropin. Oh, pronunciations today. Belladonna synthesizes atropine, which is an alkaloid that is absorbed rapidly into the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, it produces symptoms that are slow to be visible and last several days. They include dilated pupils, sensitivity to light, loss of balance, staggering about, headaches, a rash, a severely dry mouth and throat, slurring speech, urinary retention, constipation, confusion, hallucinations, delirium and convulsions. So belladonna was said to cause anyone exposed to feel, and this is like a little bit of writing that I found in regards to its effects, hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet and mad as a hen. 
Ladies of the Roman aristocracy use belladonna to dilate their pupils through dropping a few drops prepared from the plant directly into their eyes. Like what the, this blocked receptors in the eye muscles that constrict pupil size. So the effect was said to be attractive and seductive as their eyes would appear large, dark and appealing. And enlarged pupils are said to be a sign of sexual arousal. What have us women been doing to ourselves in history? Prolonged use of belladonna for this purpose calls blindness. And if you got the dosage wrong, you would just look glassy eyed and like mad starey as your pupils would be immobile. It has a narcotic nature, so it was richly used for astral projection and for aiding visions. It can stimulate the nervous system, but it paralyzes it too. So obviously very dangerous. So we talked about the witch's brew on a previous podcast episode. When I say that, it feels like us witches are all sitting around the table, like talking about these different witchy subjects with a cup of tea in hand. And I wish that was the case. So witch's brew was said to consist of belladonna, opium poppy and other poisonous plants, usually wolfsbane and hemlock. This created an ointment that they would use for hallucinations and dreamlike states for journeying and so on. And this would often make them feel like they were flying. And of course, they applied this usually by applying it to the end of a broomstick. Hating having to explain this again, but for the witches in the back, you might not have heard this episode. You would vomit if you ingested it orally. So they applied it to the end of a broomstick and inserted it into their butthole or their hoo-ha or under their armpits. Nice. Law states that the devil would plant belladonna nightly, except for Valporgis when he prepares instead for the witch's Sabbath. It's all good and well listen to this podcast, as long as you can tolerate terrible pronunciations. Priests of Bellona, who was an ancient Roman goddess of war, was said to drink an infusion of belladonna before worshipping and invoking her. It is said that in the forests where belladonna was grown, you could see a beautiful lady with long black shining hair and big dark eyes appear when the moon grew smaller and dark in its waning phase. She would seduce males she came across only for them to be found dead the very next morning. Or other tales state that these men would wake up constantly thinking about her until they became completely mad. Its magical uses are for baneful magic, astral projection, journeying, divination, sleep and crone magic. And it has, of course, long been used by shamans and witches to induce trance states. It was used for like an aura of seduction. So they created a powder from the plant and combined it with a spell The root of the plant was also used by women to attract a partner. So an old spell or like recipe was to use a root of the plant and enchant it with a spell to the goddess. The root was attached to the lower part of the dress, so like the hem, and it was said to make men crazy for you. It has also been added to sour to sow an incense as long as it is burned in the open air, but it is said that it can attract the ancient dead to the sow and feast. It's of a feminine gender. It's linked to the planets Mars and Saturn, linked to the element of water and the deities Hecate, Bologna and Circe. So lastly, let's talk all about wolf Spain. The name of this alone sounds magical, but sadly, deftly to the wolf and also panthers, but we'll get more into that. So more commonly known as lupine and under names such as aconite, monkshood, leopard's bane, women's bane, queen of all poisons, mouse bane, devil's helmet or blue rocket. So it belongs to the buttercup family, ranunculi, and it competes with hemlock for the title of Europe's most dangerous plant. The entire plant contains the alkaloid aconitine and aconitine acid 
like it has the highest concentrations in the root. That's the most dangerous part. So in folk medicine, it didn't have many uses as it was just so feared as a poison. So in ancient times, it was, of course, used as a ritual poison anyway. Its root has occasionally been mistaken for horseradish with fatal results. However, in appearance, it is shorter, darker and more fibrous. So its leaves also produce similar fatal results. Wolfsbane has leaves that are rounded. They divide into sort of five to seven segments. It has purple flowers that are helmet shaped, which is why it's given the name monk's hood too. It can grow up to one metre tall. And there is a second species of it called aconite that has yellow flowers and is very similar. Its gender is feminine, its element is water, and its planet is Saturn. In ancient times, monk's hood or wolfsbane was a feared poison associated with Medea and the underworld. I will read you a section of Ovid Metamorphoses 7.406 FF. It's a bit like, turn to Psalm 66 verse 2. If, like me, you have no idea what this is, the Ovid Metamorphoses was an 8 AD Latin narrative poem by the Roman poet Ovid. Here we go. Bent on his destruction, Medea mixed in a cup of poison which she had brought long ago from the Scythian shores. This poison, they say, came from the mouth of the Euchidna dog. There is a cavern with a dark yawning throat and a way of downsloping along which Hercules, the hero of Tyrens, dragged Cerberus with chains wrought of adamant while the great dog fought and turned away his eyes from the bright light of day. He goaded onto mad frenzy, filled all the air with his threefold howls and sprinkled the green fields with white foam. Men think that these flecks of foam grew and drawing nourishment from the rich rank soil, they gained power to hurt. And because they spring up and flourish on hard rocks, the country folk called them aconite. I'm trying not to laugh because I really got into that and my arms were waving about <laughs> and everything. <laughs> oh, so embarrassing, so dramatic. It's also said that wolfsbane was used in shamanic magic rituals. This is the bit I'm really excited about as well, right? The ancient Germans were said to have used wolfsbane in their magical rituals, such as when the berserkers were transformed into wolves. And I've recently become obsessed with two programs, no, three programs as a result of, well, my partner got me onto it basically, who's obsessed with everything Viking related. So, of course, Vikings, Ragnar, yes, Bjorn, also the program Barbarians and The Last Kingdom. If you are interested in anything like that, I am going to cover an episode on Norse witchcraft because they do touch on that within um, the show. Obviously, you want to look at like Odin and Loki and Freya and the Volvers on an episode in the near future. And following on from that, I've also got into Danheim, which is an amazing Danish Nordic artist who has like some amazing Viking themed music. And his music has a real shamanic feel to it. And I am obsessed with shamanic drumming. So I'm really here for it, here for it. So yeah, see what you think. But yeah, just found it really interesting. So coming back to Wolfsbane, it was also given the name Wolfsbane as the ancient Greeks would hunt wolves by poisoning their bait with this plant. It was even used to kill panthers. It was believed that these animals later on, because of its side effects, would develop rabies. Hunting traditions were, of course, lost, but it retained its name into the Middle Ages, where wolves and even werewolves were a genuine fear throughout Europe. So people would grow it for protection, as it was said that werewolves could be repelled by the plant or even tamed by it. It was also believed that by having contact with wolfsbane on a full moon could cause you to shapeshift. 
And you may have heard of lycanthropy, which is the delusion of being a wolf. The only way I know how to pronounce that is because of Shakira's song. So Wolfsbane was prescribed regularly, often in lethal doses by medieval doctors to treat this. It was also used within witches' brews. Some of the plant's folk names indicate that it was linked to its psychoactive purposes. So it was named like Hat of Jupiter or it was referred to as Hat of Jupiter, Venus Wagon, Wolf's Plant, Odin's Hat and Hex. So these were all to suggest that it was used for like ritual and psychoactive purposes. So it was also said that a sorceress who carried wolf's bane seeds wrapped in lizard skin could become invisible too. But coming back to ingesting it, wolf's bane is absolutely fatal. It has the alkaloid chemical aconitine, and that is the reason for the plant's toxicity. It's most concentrated in the plant's roots and seeds. When consumed, it culminates in the victim being easily excited and more vulnerable to heart failure. The poison then goes on to paralyze the nerves. It lowers blood pressure. Then it gradually stops the heart. This is from a large amount of ac aconite, but a smaller amount will cause stomach upset and a numbing of the face and mouth. So this can be dangerous, even if the flowers are touched. So if you had this in your garden, ensure you handle it with gloves. Anyway, that is all I have for you on today's episode. There are, of course, some other poisonous plants we can always delve into if you've enjoyed this episode. I would also like to delve perhaps more into like psychedelics linked to shamanic journeying and so on, but we will see. For legal reasons, <laughs> this episode is for entertainment purposes only. Lol, please don't be trying to finish off your bosses, your husbands, your mother-in-laws. But if you do, just don't tell them about me in this episode. Cool. I'm only joking. I just want to say a humongous thank you to two lovely witches who have supported and sponsored today's show, Anna from North Carolina and Meg Mango Tree. I am so bloody grateful to both of you. Thank you. I'm going to buy some new witchy books with your support, some good coffee. I'm so thankful. So, yes, thank you, ladies. I'm really appreciative. I am working on creating a Patreon site for later on this year, linked to the podcast that will be cheap as chips. On there, I plan on having grimoire pages that are linked to each episode of the show because, to be honest, the show covers a ton of research. Sometimes it might take me like a whole day to research an episode. And I know some of you say that you take notes from the podcast there is a lot that we do cover. So my plan is to release pretty witchy printouts in black and white that won't take up all your printer ink, but will be of a nice dark academia witchy feel that you might want to add to your grimoire. It gives you all the follow-up notes, all the spell work. I will, of course, add a bit more to it as well, but I will keep you posted for when this is going to be live and the prices, but we are literally talking around a fiver a month. It's not going to be a lot of money, but it will support the show. I will certainly be putting other stuff on the Patreon as well too. Once it's all lined up though, I will let you know what's going on. But I just thought I'd mention it to see if it's something that you might want to sign up for when it's up and running. I want to say a huge thank you for all of you coming back for season two. I'm so overwhelmed with the feedback and your reviews. Honestly, I love it. It's like I'm grateful beyond words. If you haven't left me a review, but you feel the call to, I'll be so grateful because it means more witches can find the show. I would love to do more with the podcast. I'm like just really immersing myself in this now. So, yes, thank you so much for listening. Other than that, have a great week, witches. I'll be back soon. Lots and lots of witchy love. <laughs>